black women are three to four times more likely to die of a pregnancy-related death as compared to white women. Black women also experience higher rates of maternal complications and infant mortality. They're twice as likely to lose an infant to premature death. And these disparities have not improved in more than 30 years. Welcome to Advancing Health, a podcast brought to you by the American Hospital Association. I'm Tom Hederly, senior writer for AHA. In response to these alarming statistics, Illinois Congresswoman Lauren Underwood and North Carolina Congresswoman Alma Adams launched the Black Maternal Health Caucus to address one of the most urgent health crises in the United States today. In this podcast, Priscilla Ross, AHA Senior Associate Director for Federal Relations, speaks with Congresswoman Underwood, co-chair of the caucus, about its mission to elevate the black maternal health crisis within Congress and advance policy solutions to improve maternal health outcomes and end disparities. We're delighted to be here today with Representative Lauren Underwood to talk about strategies to improve maternal health in this nation. Thank you, Congresswoman, for joining us today. Oh, thank you for having me. You and Representative Alma Adams announced the creation of the Black Maternal Health Caucus in April 2019, only three months into your first term in the House. What motivated you to assume leadership on this issue, and what do you and Congresswoman Adams hope to accomplish? Well, I was so excited to be able to work with Congresswoman Adams in this way. Uh, We just had some early conversations about issues that we both cared about, things that we wanted to work on, and identified maternal mortality as an opportunity where we could be impactful. Um, I was really delighted because I had a friend from graduate school, Dr. Shalon Irving, who was a PhD epidemiologist down at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. She was uh, an officer in the United States Public Health Service Commission Corps, and she died three weeks after giving birth to her baby daughter, Soleil. She was 36 years old. So it's a highly educated African-American woman, employed, had health insurance, had done everything right, and delivered her baby uh, in a metropolitan area, had access to all the things that you should have, and yet she still died of um, something that is far too common among black women in our country. Every year, 700 black women die as a result of giving birth. And, um, you know, I think it's time we do something about it. Over the course of my lifetime, I'm 33 years old, we've not seen major national initiatives, we've not seen major goal setting, major investment in reducing the maternal mortality rate in the United States. And yet, the United States leads the developed world and maternal mortality. The United States overall average is high because African American women and Native American women have uh, these enormous disparities. And so what a treat and honor for me to be able to focus some of my work here in the United States Congress on this issue that is so important. Those are truly sobering statistics. The caucus has quite a diverse membership in the House. How did you go about recruiting your colleagues to join the caucus, and what have you learned so far about their interest in the issue and what they are hearing in their congressional districts? Well, you know, it's so interesting. When we first launched the caucus, I thought it was going to be Congresswoman Adams and I, and we are going to just team up and work together on this issue. And we gave ourselves a name because that's what you do here in Congress. You know, everything's a caucus or a task force or, you know, something like that. But... I thought it was just going to be the two of us, and I was fine with that, overjoyed and delighted, honestly, to have a partner to work on this issue with. Why not? And then the day that we launched, this cloudy day in April, we had a press conference in front of the Capitol, and who joined us? The majority leader, Cindy Hoyer, was there. Barbara Lee, our champion Barbara Lee, senior member of the House, uh, appropriator, she was there. Joe Kennedy was there. We had... You know, just uh, the first day, so many members that had joined us in this caucus. We had bipartisan participation on day one, which is something that I never expected. And now we're up to close to 100 members. Um, We have members from all across the country. So there was real geographic diversity, real diversity of thought and background. And what I appreciate is every member who's joined this caucus 
really cares about this issue. They understand why it's important and it's meaningful to them. And we're able to, to approach this issue where traditionally, I think you would assume that there would be a real maybe partisan or ideologic point of view and there's not. And so as a result of this partnership, um, bipartisan partnership, we've been able to have early success um, as a result of these caucus members who are serious about doing this work, serious about saving lives and working together. Um, and so what I'm referencing is a bill that moved out of the Energy and Commerce Committee late in 2019, the, Help, the Helping Moms Act. And so what that will be, would be the first Medicaid expansion since the Affordable Care Act passed in 2010 to extend a full year postpartum Medicaid coverage to new moms after, and which is a huge deal because under the current statute, new moms in states that did not expand Medicaid would have their Medicaid eligibility terminate after 60 days. And so we know from the data that a full third of maternal deaths occur after that window. And so if women don't have coverage, they don't have an opportunity to get care, then we are in a bad place in terms of saving lives. And we also know that these kind of Medicaid improvements are so critical because Medicaid pays for well over half of births in the United States and certainly among the African-American population. So when we think about opportunities to intervene and when we think about uh, areas, policy-making areas that are critical for activity, Medicaid is one that's so important. And so Dr. Burgess and his leadership um, was so critical on getting that passed out of the Energy and Commerce Committee. I'm grateful for Robin Kelly, who has been a longtime champion on this issue, certainly prior to my uh, election to Congress. And we have um, other members like Jamie Herrera Butler, who passed a critical bill at, at the end of the 115th Congress. And so there's been a lot of activity, but now it's being crystallized. Uh, in a way that I think is uh, exciting, encouraging, um, and suggests to me that there are more uh, developments and solutions on the horizon. It shows a lot of bipartisan interest and the, the ability to really make changes. Yes. And, and I think that's terrific. Thank you. What are the most impactful initiatives that Congress can take beyond the ones you've mentioned? to reduce maternal mortality and morbidity? Yes, so you know our activities are really focusing in a few key areas. When I say our activities, I mean the Black Maternal Health Caucus. One, you know, we know the United States Congress has a huge power around convening, right? Raising an issue, inviting stakeholders in, and having critical conversations, uh, both among members of Congress and the larger community. And so we've done just that. We had a Black Maternal Health uh, Summit this summer, which was a huge success. We had a room in the Capitol for probably three or four hours, standing room only, the entire time. And if you know anything about Capitol Hill, you know that traditionally people are in and out. They'll come in, say 15 minutes, leave out, tip out, tip out the back. And so, you know, there might be a lot of interest at the beginning and at the end, it's a little bit of a sparse room. Oh no. We had probably between 30 and 40 stakeholder groups that presented what they had been working on. And so, and a, really an ability to help those stakeholders make connections among themselves because this umbrella of groups that have been working on this issue for decades um, haven't necessarily had a national forum in which to convene. So everybody from like the March of Dimes to provider groups, um, everybody from community-based, like geographically specific stakeholders, um, to you know, national leaders like the Black Mama Matters, Black Mamas Matter Alliance, right? Like, to have everybody in a room around the table is really powerful. So that's one really important area. Second thing that we're doing is we are working on legislation. Um, and so some things uh, had been carryovers from the 115th Congress. We're really excited about those. Um, and then we took some of the suggestions from those stakeholders after the summit, put them sort of in a chart, looked at existing legislation put that in the chart and identify the gaps. And now we are working on a suite of bills and we're calling it the Mommy Bus. For those people who are very familiar with Capitol Hill, you're familiar with the term omnibus, which is an idea of multiple pieces of legislation being put together and moved as a package. And we're doing the same thing, but for moms. And so our Mommy Bus is gonna focus on a few key areas. Uh, our new legislation is gonna cover social determinants of health. We're gonna be working to grow and diversify the perinatal workforce 
such as accredited midwives. And so when we look at workforce issues in particular, we know that there is a real challenge around the country, particularly as you go to the more rural areas, the places without academic medical centers, uh, and just community-based care. We know that there are many communities around this country that lack access to providers that the woman would choose. So it's one thing to just have somebody, but everybody doesn't want just somebody, right? Women want to have a choice in who their provider is, feel confident and comfortable and know and feel that sense of uh, comfort with that relationship. And we want to make sure that every woman in America has that kind of provider choice. And so making sure that we are growing and diversifying this workforce is a really key issue area. Uh, we are going to be doing some improved data collection and reporting. And this is huge. Um, there are real inconsistencies, uh, a lot of gaps, um, some inaccuracies as, in how states report maternal mortality. Um, and so we want to make sure that there are standards in place and resources available for those uh, municipalities as they do their reporting. We're going to be making key investments in telehealth and technology to improve maternal health outcomes. This is an area which we know there's a lot of bipartisan interest in telemedicine. And so I'm um, excited to you know, lift up ideas that our colleagues have across that ideologic spectrum. Uh, we are going to be supporting women veterans in their prenatal and postpartum periods. And so that's an area I think that's really rich with opportunity. As we know, women veterans are the fastest growing segment of our veterans population. Um, and the VA, just as an organization, is one that I would say has um, inconsistent service availability for women veterans um, across the lifespan. One of the uh, incredible opportunity areas for women veterans is that uh, we have uh, folks that are recently separated from service. They may be millennials or Gen Z, all the way up to the Cadet Nurse Corps members from World War II who are still alive and seeking care, right? And so delivering that care across the lifespan for uh, and gender-specific care is an area of improvement that the House Veterans Affairs Committee that I serve on has been working with the VA to improve, and we are going to be engaging in maternal mortality work there. Uh, next, we are focusing on supporting incarcerated pregnant women, uh, which, as we know, there are major disparities, uh, gaps in service delivery, uh, and making sure that people are who are showing early signs of severe morbidity are being able to get access to the care that they need um, while incarcerated. Uh, we will be funding community-based organizations and supporting bias training. So here's the thing. When, uh, in my first year of Congress, you know, uh, learning the lingo a little bit, and one of the words, one of the phrases that has been getting a lot of attention here recently is something called implicit bias. And uh, one of the ways that it's been championed to address uh, implicit bias is training. Now, I'm happy to support uh, that kind of training, glad that the caucus can lift up evidence-based solutions to address the root causes of racism in this country and help the health professional workforce, including just the healthcare system, right? So you don't have to be the provider to need this training. You can be the receptionist and not be turning people away, right? Like everybody who's interacting <laughs> with that woman and her family needs this training. And we can call it whatever we want as far as I'm concerned. But right now we're calling it implicit bias. Uh, and we are just gonna be funding just general support for maternal health. So HRSA, the Health Resources and Services Administration at HHS has been doing great work for a long time on maternal health. Uh, but we're really excited to be working with our partners like the United States Surgeon General a Trump appointee, like Secretary Azar, a Trump appointee, to be making sure that maternal health and maternal mor morbidity and mortality are being lifted up across the board at HHS that they're being invested in. And so since our caucus has launched, we've seen now uh, that the agency has stood up task forces, uh, stood up uh, opportunities to work across issue areas, to invest in research, and to really build those bridges between what NIH knows what CDC knows and how CMS is delivering these programs through Medicaid, mm -hmm. through the marketplace mm -hmm. to help these women. And so I'm excited about the possibilities that lie ahead 
in this work that's not just purely legislative, right? It's coalition building, it's convening, and it's creating a space uh, to have this really important national dialogue and conversation. Hospitals really want to be part of that dialogue. We are committed to addressing this issue mm -hmm. nationwide. Mm -hmm. How can hospitals and health systems keep informed about the work you're doing and support you in that work. Well, thank you for the work that you're doing, and I'm really excited to have the American Hospital Association as a partner with the Black Maternal Health Caucus because we know the incredibly rich membership that you have, uh, the good work that is happening in communities all across our country, and there's so much that hospitals already are doing and can continue to do. And so one of my favorite parts of this job as being uh, the co-chair of the Black Maternal Health Caucus is hearing these best practices straight from communities. And so if you are a health systems leader who um, knows that you have done some incredibly innovative, exciting work, you have data to show the impact, we want to see it. Send it to us. You can find us online. We have a website. You just get on Google, Black Maternal Health Caucus. You can find us at BMH Caucus on Twitter. And um, you can slide in the DMs if you want, you know, like whatever. Uh, but we just want to hear from you and be able to lift up these stories uh, and best practices because we are, that's how we're getting the ideas for the legislation. So that's one area. Second thing is that we know across the country that many facilities are um, taking advantage of the AIM bundle. So the Alliance for Innovation on Maternal Health, AIM, is a national data-driven maternal safety and quality improvement initiative. Um, to improve outcomes throughout the country. We know that hospitals or health systems, um, some are participating, right? And there are some incentives in place to help encourage that. But everyone is not participating. And we want to increase that participation number. Um, and so HRSA, through the Maternal Child Health Bureau, has some funding um, from AIM through a cooperative agreement, and there's certain bundles, right? So if you want to take on depression and anxiety and improve your psych mental health delivery in the maternal health space, right? There's some funding and resources to help you do that. Whereas if you might want to deal with postpartum care in your health system, right, and making sure that you're connecting the dots there, you can do that. You don't have to, it's a big problem, right? Multifactorial to solve. And we know that the hospitals and health systems do need resources to help tackle these issues. Um, and so the AIM program is something that we are very, very, very excited about, um, just because the evidence has shown that it's impactful, right? That when hospitals and health systems implement this program, it helps save lives. Um, and it really destigmatizes when these adverse events happen, right? Because we know that culturally within a healthcare system, we need to have a safe space for clinicians and providers to be able to ask questions, lift up errors, and problem solve together in a non-punitive environment, right? Because we know that there's obviously lots of that happening in our healthcare system. But if we're gonna be really serious about saving lives, and we're gonna be really serious about moving forward um, in a way where consistently across our country, we're going to be making changes and improvements. We gotta give folks tools and resources in order to make that happen. And this is a program um, that we are certainly championing to do that. So if you, again, are a leader in any community across our country, and you hear this and you're like, hmm, let's check it out, please do. And you know our caucus is here to help you if you need some help. That's, those are very inspiring words. I wanna thank you and your staff again for all the wonderful work that you're doing in this area, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you, appreciate it.